Hello everyone, welcome to the second part of the lesson. In the previous lectures, we have discussed the different types of bilingual education programs. We look at those types of the pro of bilingual program from the perspective of educators and curriculum designers and even teachers. So we look at um, specifically, we look at the content um, and how bilingual teaching shall be operated inside the classroom. However, a significant important factor that would affect the performance of a bilingual and the possibilities of success of a bilingual program is the language that students speak. The language itself, uh, including the mental lexicon, you know, how the word gonna trigger the mental representations in the student mind. It can be also the grammar, the word order, or even pronunciation of a language that can determine the speed of student English learning. The focus of this lecture is on the perspective of linguistics to review how the differences between the two languages or what we call the language distance decides the construct of multi-competence in bilingual students. Let's start. Now take a look at the pictures I have here and close your eyes and try your best to just you know imitate some of the sentences from different languages beside English. Which kind of language would pop up first? Probably some of you will say, okay, I think it's just the way how the character looks. I, it's easier, it takes me a shorter time to come up with hola or guten tag or hola or xiao, xiao rather than you know like ni hao um, in Chinese or some you know or some like like even Farsi language or or you know it's easier for bonjour to come up than the ni hao character why is that yeah you're right you will realize that it may take you a longer time to learn a language, um, whereas it might take you a shorter time to learn another language. Why so? Yeah, so it's not just only how it looks, right? How how the sentences are from, a form can be formed, like the position of now verbs in a sentence is also different uh, across the languages. So this can cause, you know, difficulties and challenge for you as well. But in some languages, the, the word other may be similar, you know, so it's take you a shorter time to process and can easy, um, can be easy for you to remember and retrieve. Yeah. So how to describe the differences between English language and Chinese language then? Yeah, you're right. You're right. So when we learn the first language, it's actually subconsciously and naturally emerged in our conceptual base, and we automatically know that that is the way to form an English sentence. But when you come to learn another language, you have to go not the top down, not just expose you to the environment and you know how it works, right? It takes time for you to process and even break down the elements of the language. So it's more like a bottom up. First of all, you have the vocab and then you have a string of vocab and then you have a meaningful string of vocab placed in a particular order that make it make sense to the native speaker of that target language. Is a sentence and then from the sentence you have the paragraph. Uh, and even an essay, but the organization of the essay has to make some kind of logical flow according to the native speaker of that language, of course. And so it is necessary 
for linguistics to really look uh, and try to describe those rules so that other speakers from other languages can learn, can study a new language. So that makes you think a little bit, right? Um, do you think a native speaker can actually teach a language? Or it has to be a person who knows the knowledge of the grammar of how that language actually works so that he or she can teach another person. Can you learn a language just by purely expose yourself to the environment of that language and just merely imitation? And if so, do you think that if a person, a bilingual student, come to the United States with low proficiency of English, do you think that you can just expose a student into the mainstream education environment without any, you know, explicit grammar teaching and that student can still be fine? So those are the questions that, you know, urge the linguist to answer and to somehow explain to the ESL teachers that, okay, I think as the, you know, first, I think uh, he's from Chinese and Chinese is so different than English. So he must have this way of working on grammar in order to overcome the, the interference, the cross-linguistic interference and, you know, to promote the language transfers more smoothly, right? So. Let's see how linguists can decide the linguistic distance between two languages. All right, let me give you the definition of linguistic distance. Uh, there are a lot of definitions out there, uh, but in the book that we read particularly, it is called typological closeness. So, is the relative degree of similarity between two languages? So, some languages have similar linguistic features and are said to be closed. Others have very different linguistic features and are said to be distant. For example, two languages may have similar word order rules and similar rules for certain syntactic or phonological structures. There is said to be a greater degree of linguistic distance between English and French, for example, than between French and Spanish. Language distance is thought to be one factor which influences the ease or difficulty with which learners acquire new languages. So, can we actually really measure it? Mm, in spite of the fact that a number of researchers have attempted to measure it or to establish measurement system for determining the accurate linguist, linguistic distance, um, there has been very little literature dealing with this topic in the holistic approach. I have not been able to find any article that firmly refers to a measurement system that could function as a robust and accurate tool to measure the distance between languages. In other words, no study has established any solid standards or criteria to measure it yet. Finally, there is actually a new perspective uh, that the book proposed, as you can see, it not just only uh, look at the linguistic only, but also look at how language is used or the pragmatic oriented languages compared with uh, the, the, the kind of language that is more restricted in the grammatical order. So we will talk about it later, uh, but first of all, just have the general idea that they somehow linguists can propose by comparing the order, the word order rules and the syntactic and phonological structure. So somehow can describe the closeness amongst languages. So 
Back to the very first discussion that was brought up in the introduction section, I mentioned about poor second language learners. So it is usually that the difficulty uh, or the degree of second language learnability is heavily dependent upon the distance between the languages. Um, the first and the second lang language, for example, However, there seems to be, you know, a lot of other major factors, that extra linguistic factors that we will discuss later in the lesson as well. So with the assumption that it is possible to compare the grammar and the rules of two languages and then try to map it, how easy to learn it, how easily a student can learn it and how difficulty, difficultly a student can learn it. Uh, I'll give you a demonstration. So take a look at the pictures. You will see that, uh, let me see, for example, the group one languages will be Danish, Dutch, French, Italian, Portuguese. You can see the length of straining uh, in order to reach a proficiency level. You see, so for example, it takes like eight weeks in order to have the intermediate low level. Whereas in group two language like Indonesia, Malay or German, it takes 16 weeks. So English properly, where is English actually? Do you see it? I can see that, oh, I see Vietnamese is in group three. So actually it takes you 16 weeks. And then you can be novice high. Mm. Well, I'm a little bit, you know, I'm doubtful about that. I don't think that it's easy like that. And even with Korean or Japanese or Chinese in group four, you can see after 16 weeks, 480 hours, you can be novice high level. I mean, you can like communicate and actually like form sentences. Hmm, interesting. Well, this is the Foreign Service Institute that belongs to the United States Department of State. Um, it is the federal government primary training institute for officers and support personnel uh, of the U.S. foreign affairs community. So they prepare American diplomats and other professional training to advance the U.S. foreign affairs interests overseas. Uh, and so they depend on, they created this list to indicate the approximate time a well-educated American would need to learn a specific language as an English native speaker. So you can try. Uh, the table is uh, just an excerpt of that list, of course. But the assumption based uh, beyond that is it based, it depends on the, their categorization showing the difficulty to learn foreign languages and indicating the length of time that the learner would need. So that this is called the American Council of Teachers of Foreign Languages scale. So they're based on this to have the curriculum and uh, the content to teach about a language knowledge of a language yep so let's summarize so language typology is the first criteria on the list like how we can compare the two language so it's actually the descriptive way in which universal can be expected. You know, like if I can describe Chinese as a grammar, I can also describe English, like any language can be described, can be uh, concluded as a systematic set of rules to apply so that you can, you know, improve your language abilities that make you closer to the native speaker. Uh, and of course, that natures of rules can affect the development of the second language grammars. Yeah, since you have the first language grammar already established, uh, if the second grammar is similar, it's easy to learn. If it is not similar to foreign, that's so difficult to learn. And then 
it will also very interesting in the way that it will affect the acquisition order as well. So for example, in my study uh, that I that I'm doing right now, I figure out that a bilingual student have more have to take more time to be uh, to use the adjective correctly uh, with in within an appropriate context whereas for the nouns it they, they acquire it faster so um the language typology can also affect the acquisition of order for example you will observe that your student just makes specific like a lot of errors in their writing just focus on a specific aspect so for example the verb forms the verb forms uh, and as you can see, the mark forms are the one that are last to be acquired. Um, whereas in the case of implicational universal, one could expect fewer error in the less mark forms. Uh, so let's, you know, simply speaking, uh, you will recognize that, for example, in Vietnam, we don't, uh, in Vietnam, we don't pronounce the final sound. So you will see that when I learn how to speak English, actually learn to speak the final sound would be very challenge, challenging for me. Like I can say, I speak, not speak, right? So to me, those differences take me a longer time to adapt and to accommodate. Um, and this is the force. So the nature of the grammar, between two languages can determine the shape of the learner grammar by that by that uh what by what i have just said right um so you will see that it will emerge in the second language production of your learners when you see the errors don't assume that uh it is something that they should have known and they you know they cause the error. No, assume that there's some factors that interferes their decision making, and your job is to, uh, you know, diagnose like a doctor, right? You tell where's the root of the problem, and whether if the explicit grammar teaching or explicit explanation between the differences between two languages can be helpful to help your student to overcome that errors. So we talk about language typology is how we can describe the distance between two languages depending on the way that we describe the grammar and whether the grammar is easy to learn or difficult to learn. Okay, so it's focused on the word formation and the grammatical word order. The language typology is focused on the grammatical word order. So the people who support this this way of categorizing the differences among languages they want to categorize uh, language into two categories the first category they group languages uh, into the category called configurational languages configurational languages english or french okay so they they, they try to group the language that have these similar characteristics, okay? Those are the languages that have bell word order governed by grammatical rules and subject prominence. Okay, grammatical rules, I explained already, like if you want to express one idea, you have to use this structure. But if you want to express another idea, you have to know the grammatical structure of that one as well in order for it to make sense, right? So it more stick to the grammar rules and you cannot change it. If you change the sentence structure, you change the meaning. Or even it's ungrammatical, there will be no meaning delivered. So for example, you say like, I love you. You cannot say like, love you, I, right? But in Vietnamese, you can say, uh, tôi yêu em, it means I love you. 
and and then the meaning will not change if I say uh, em yêu tôi or tôi em yêu tôi em yêu or em tôi yêu so even I change uh, the, 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 the structure of the sentence um, nothing gonna change the meaning is the same like tôi yêu em um, em tôi yêu similar meaning so it's not really configurational languages if you stick to this definition okay stick to this definition okay because there are a lot of other definition about what is configurationality as well so phrase structure configuration phrase structure configuration and call the grammatical function and the logical relation can only be computed at a virtual level of representation okay uh, simply speaking if you change the sentence structure there's no make sense so for those languages what do you think we shall teach yeah you're right we shall focus more on the sentence structure and let the student distinguish that they have to write that way or else we change the meaning right um, and then of course Vietnamese or Russian or Hungarian they will be like they will be group in uh, non-configurational languages because they have complex morphology and a word order well I just let you I'll let you know that uh, it may seem easy to know that you can change uh, some parts of uh, change the sentence structure some part in the sentence uh, in a Vietnamese sentence and is to make the similar meaning but think about that it will be very complicated to use the, 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 the that structure that that way of saying in real life context you know you don't know which structure should go with that what meaning right should go with which meaning so that's why they tend to be governed by pragmatic and they are called topic prominent rather than grammatical rules so you have to know that okay we use this kind of structure when we have this context and we don't use that in another context because as we change the meaning the social cultural meaning like it's not polite to say that okay so phrase structure expresses logical relation and grammatical function are encoded morphologically so I uh, just show you the pictures okay just look at the pictures this is a visual way to kind of uh, visualize the categories that the scholar have just proposed so configurational language you have to have that you know is there someone here you cannot say is here someone there because it's different okay but non-configuration it's more like a mingle like a like you know, is there someone here who Japanese? Uh, well, if I translate it in Vietnamese, I can have many sentence structures, still the same meaning. So, that non configurational language. Okay? So, um, if you support this way of thinking, non configurational languages are mainly uh, you know they they not they, they kind of like stick together and uh, in English you can see that the words are the know that these were have the relationship with each other right uh, the position of a noun is to decide the subject so that's it called subject dominant because you know without the subject and the actions are uh, with, with the subject and then the verb and then the object right uh, without that SVO without subject verb object order doesn't make sense right but in some languages uh, they have free morphemes it means basically one word can have the meaning and can can move around 
Uh, so languages like Japanese or Vietnamese, they are more purely analytic in structure. They don't need to have prefaces, suffixes. Um, but you know, it's very rare to find a language that is purely analytic or you know, purely synthet synthetic uh, like that. So Mandarin Chinese and Vietnamese are good examples of analytic languages. English, on the other hand, is, you know, sometimes it can be analytic. Actually, uh, English is one of the most analytic Indo-European languages, but it's still usually classified as a synthetic language. We can also have another kind of language called acclude Tinating languages with these languages more themes, you know, the, the 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 words are usually clearly recognizable in a way that make it easy to tell uh, where the boundaries are. Uh, so their emphasis usually only have a single meaning, like Turkish, Korean, Hungarian, Japanese, and Finnish are all in this group. So, as you can see, this is the analytic one, right? Um, you can see that I circle them this way. I want to say that they can move around. They can move around. Um, they have the meaning by themselves and can move around to form a sentence. So, configurational language follow a strict structure the subject is the the subject dominate the message and then the subject without the subject we cannot understand like if i say eat doesn't make sense you have to say i eat if i say eat banana it would be different than i need to eat a banana Whereas in non-configurational structure, it can be subject, object, and the verb. So when I say đi học, it means go to school. But in English, it makes sense. The, the topic prominent is the action. And then everyone can understand the subject that I imply in the sentence based on the context, of course but it doesn't need a subject to make a grammatical sentence structure. So those are the differences uh, between configurational languages and non-configurational non languages. Let me give you another example. So you look at the Hungarian, you also see that in sentence A and sentence B, they just different in the contextual meaning, in the pragmatic meaning. So they will use A and B in different situation. But if you cancel the context, how you arrange the word order in a sentence, you don't change anything. So for example, in A, you use the word like that, like the worst phrase that I I circle in in purple and in green. You use them, you just have to move the order of them and then it can make another meaning. You cannot do it in English, right? Suddenly you will say another topic prominent in Mandarin and Japanese. For example, in Mandarin I say 这个人 个子很高. So I have the topic. This person is, I don't call this person as a subject. Uh, it's a topic that I'm talking about. And the topic is about, about the height of that person. So I have subject, object, and the adjective. Where in Japanese is the similar thing. You know, that palm tree, I don't call it a subject, even if it's at the beginning of the sentence. But it signal that I'm talking about a topic. So the message 
the verb, the adjective is the important thing, not the subject. The subject can somehow be omitted. Okay, and so you can look at table 2. I put here is the mattress of linguistic distance from the study of is 14 in 2013. Uh, so, you know, like, we don't have time to really break down into like how these are measured. But the idea beyond this table is just what we're talking about. So they measure the complexity of linguistic structure of a language and then compare it with other languages. And so you can see, so for example, between English and Hungarian, you can see it's so far away from each other. From each other is 95.22 score is so far away from each other is so different from each other it regarding the grammar and the word other where it English and let me see English and and Dutch 63.22 is better right it's, it's, it's closer to each other uh, for example, Arabic, okay, Arabic and Dutch, you can see 100, or Japanese and Dutch, 101, Korean and German, 104.30, so it's super, super difficult for a Korean to learn German because it's actually a totally different system of, you know, of what other, or grammar rules. And you can see that Vietnam, even Vietnamese and English is very dif difficult to learn. Yeah, for Vietnamese to learn English. So why we have to know the linguistic distance? Because it gives us the idea that our student may struggle with the linguistic um, elements itself. Like just how to systematize the understanding of two languages in their mind you know in their mind first i'm not i'm not you know uh talking even about the skill the production right so even the way that the the brain process the language when a student hear or read it can be also different like think about if i'm coming from a topic prominent uh language the way that I process a sentence would be so different than the English native speakers. You would process the subject first. I may process the verb first, right? So it's interesting to know this. Mm, after we go through the categorization of configurality between two languages, do you think that grammar is the only characteristic for us to distinguish? two languages well some scholar criticized that um, for example Hell say that the term configurationality is not a particularly appropriate one since the notion of configuration is in the same of a hierarchical organizations of constituents is essential to all languages so even though I can say that Vietnamese can, you know, the word other can be more flexible than English, it doesn't mean that Vietnamese doesn't have any rules or grammar rules or uh, a specific word other for a sentence to make sense, right? Um, he also said that non-configurationality is not a global property of languages, rather it's a property of construction. I suspect strongly that there is no single parameters giving rise to the various properties commonly associated with the term non-figurational. So we may need another dimension to look at um, so that it's not just only grammar but other aspects can describe the difference between two languages and we need to pay attention to it. Um, amongst uh, our bi for teaching our, our bilingual students so that is the reason why in the book of Keshki and Tunpap they actually don't categor 
really support the categorization of configura uh, configurational language and non-configurational language. Rather, they propose a, a more uh, specific aspect to compare is that whether a language is really, uh, you know, restricted by grammatical word order or can be pragmatic um, word order. So, for example, if it is grammatical word order like English, it means grammar is very it's very important and a necessary knowledge to 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 prioritize. Whereas if a language is more pragmatic word order, so the student can learn how to form the language pretty early. But what makes the language difficult is the knowledge about how the languages, how the sentence structure can be constructed based on the pragmatic purpose. What is the purpose of the speakers when they want to emphasize something? For example, like that, the words within the sentence can change, uh, but change in which way to denote the meaning that the that makes sense in that particular context, right? So he plays, they plays the languages on a continuum on which the languages with strong grammatical word are the dominance are positioned on the left and the languages with strong pra pragmatic word are the dominance are placed on the right. So English, Grammatical word near grammatical word other French also German also Japanese in the middle because to a certain extent it really requires structure but in other um, on the other hand it also depends a lot on the context where it appear that the sentence could be constructed and then Italian Russian Hungarian Finnish you can see Chinese Vietnamese it's more pragmatic word other. So the relationship of the two or more languages in language learner is strongly affected, as you can see, by the natures of grammar, by the typological um, characteristic. Uh, of course, we know that you know it's undeniable that um, the beginning of the student, the proficiency. You know, the proficiency of the student is also the variable that decide their, um, you know, how fast they learn a language. For example, if it is an English advanced bi bilingual, right, a, a bilingual student who has an advanced English uh, proficiency, it would take him or her faster to learn a new concept where it was a low proficiency. There need to be a lot of construction and scaffolding. Uh, related to you know vocab and then sentence structure things like that so the first variable i would say is the level of proficiency and the second is the topic that we have just discussed the linguistic distance the typological closeness and this is very objective side right because it depends on the language itself right the language has its own grammar knowledge that a language learner needs to master master like there's no way to really help that but to really sit down and study the rules however there's also a subjective side is also like the individual side and that's explain why if why um, just a mere exposure um, student into like the mainstream education may not work because actually if they don't you know, internalize. They don't mix. They they don't mix sense of how the language is used in that target language culture. Then they will just keep repeating the errors when they use that language. Um, for I myself, even I have been learning English for more than you know fifteen years in my life, I still have some mismatch. Uh, with the native speaker regarding to the cultural distance, right? So deep down, uh, I, I, I still need maybe explicit explanation in how language is used and how, you know, why do you say this expression rather than the other in this particular case? Um, 
And why do you celebrate Thanksgiving? What is the concept of Thanksgiving? What is the concept of Black uh, Friday? Um, even like, for example, yesterday I went to the clinic and the nurse keeps saying things like the provider will come and answer your question. So in my mind, the provider is the company who make the medicine, but actually the provider uh, can be a doctor in that situation. So a doctor actually come to see me after the nurse. So I don't know that the word provider used in the American culture can mean this way. So there are very subjective sides, really depends on my personal experience with the language. So that is, I call the psychotypology. Psychotypology. And uh, Keshki and uh, Toon Pap said that the further the culture is, the more difficult it is for the learner to acquire concepts to acquire a concept. So it's bigger than just individual work. I totally have no problem understanding what provider means, but I have problem to build the concept of, you know, how to interact uh, with the staff in the hospital or how the procedures of the hospital should be, right? And of course, it's really different than my first language culture. So I need time to really reconceptualize those first language words in my mind. So provider in my language actually mean doctor because we don't have the same procedure. So I have to reconceptualize my understanding about his, his, uh, about the hospital frame, right? After my exposure to the second language uh, culture and internalize and reflect on my experience. So by saying that Arabic, Chinese and Japanese cause more problem for English native speakers because exotic cultures are represented in words denoting concepts that do not exist in Western culture or need reconceptualization. Now, why do we as ESL teacher have to know the theory of typological cloneness and psychotypical typology? Well, it's because to compare a language with English, the language, the first language of the student with English, you need to have a holistic considera consideration of three contextual elements that will affect them. First of all is the complexity of writing system, you know? the typological, including how the character is written, how it looks like, right? So if it's Latin words, and the first language is Latin words, it's easier. I have a hard time learning Chinese because Vietnamese writing system is all Latin. So it's like a totally different system. So the complexity of writing system as a representation of spoken language. Is it so different from each other, right? For my Chinese study, all I have to do, first of all, is to start with hours of practicing how to write. Not, not mention, not to mention the, the word meaning, okay? Just how to write a character, so complex. Uh, second is the grammar. How different is a grammatical system as the framework for communication in L1 and L2? The word order, right? When we talk about grammar, word order, tense, you know, how you, um, how you string the individual words in meaningful sentences. And then the semantic system. Here, semantic system, including the pragmatic use right in the cultural so uh, societal environment situation so in the book it said that for example you can diagnose the student with uh to come when you compare the two languages one is a near uh second is middle and number three is remote so actually for example i would say if i compare vietnamese and chinese i would say that it will be um, 
A3 because you know A3 because I would say that the writing system is so remote between Vietnamese and Chinese. I would say B1 because it's the grammar between two languages is pretty the same, they're similar. Um, even Vietnamese has the root uh, in the history um, that we follow a lot of uh, Chinese grammar at the beginning of our history, our country history. And then the cultural, I would say that it would be C1. We are neighboring country and the cultural outlook and the meaning of the words is so similar to each other. So think about a case when you have the student from another language. Think about how different, how far it is regarding to writing system, grammar, and culture. So that is the application of the reading. All right. So let me summarize these lectures by um, just point out some important key takeaways. So why do we have to know this? theory of linguistic distance and multi-competence because the performance in first language is facilitated by the knowledge of a foreign language, the second language, the third language, only when the proficiency in this foreign language is sufficiently high or else the student will mainly, mainly just depend entirely their understanding and their language production on the first language. To have multi-competence, that is the aim, right? The goal of bilingual education is biliteracy. So the language learner has to use the language for real because second language participation is crucial for the development of multimodal conceptual representation, not just acquiring the code. So that's, it. that's what is the point? So the point is that you may let your student to do exercise such as fill in the plank, uh, it's not enough if it's not meaningful or relevant to their context. So that is the way uh, somehow we say content-based teaching is, is good because actually the content is a way um, to help them explore to academic context of language use, whereas for develop, you know, speaking. Uh, so, you know, knowing the grammar by doing fill in the blank or word formation exercise, it's just the first step. The second step had to, um, you have to encourage your student to use the language in group discussion or to in individual presentation. So that actually using the language in the target culture, it is very important. And then transfer is affected by the learner perception of language distance between first language and second, the structural and social cultural organization of these. I explained um, in previous part that if you have the first language and second language too dif different from each other, um, it takes a longer time for your student to transfer and relate um, similar concepts, to link concepts together, to uh, build up their understanding of a new concept. So, and lastly, I just want to stress the extra linguistic factors such as social identity, relation of power, anxiety, and motivation of the individual may seriously influence this process, especially in a second language environment. So that means you have to think about some other factors that may affect them beside the linguistic distance motivation, the intake, and how to create the classroom in a way that uh, help them to accelerate the transfer. So for example, if first language is allowed, you can also say, okay, what is the, you know, how you can say it in the first language? Or let the student explain it again using their first language understanding and somehow the first language understanding can help them to understand the second language concept. So I hope this lecture is helpful for your understanding of the reading of the book and also your own real world teaching. Thank you and see you again in the next lesson. Remember, we still have part three, uh, but it's more like a PDF. Uh, so you spend time to read the slide and answer the question. Thank you so much and see you soon. Bye bye.